Hello, and welcome to our Arizona State University's College of Health Solutions Health Talk Series. The College of Health Solutions addresses the challenges facing people and communities to stay healthy, improve the health, and manage chronic disease. This Health Talk Series is one way that we serve the community with timely and relevant educational talks that also provide continuing and free educational credit. I'm Swapna Reddy, and I'm your moderator and also a presenter today. I'm a clinical assistant professor at the College of Health Solutions, and my areas of interest are in health policy and health disparities, very specifically how the law and policy can be used as tools to improve the health and health outcomes of uh, vulnerable populations. So at that, I will begin um, by really quickly letting you know uh, the, the great guests that are joining me today. I'm joined today by Dr. Quinn Snyder, uh, who is an emergency medicine physician and director of analytics and Arizona regional operations. He's, he is with American Physician Partners, which provides emergency medicine services here in the East Valley. I'm also joined by Christy Roschke, Managing Director news of the News Collab at ASU's Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication. This initiative that she leads helps people find new ways of understanding and interacting with the news and with information. She's taught courses on digital media literacy to high school and college students for the past 18 years. The discussion that we're having today is called Health Information and Misinformation During COVID-19. What can we believe? And I think just from the sheer interest and number of individuals that have registered um, and the folks that we're going to give a, a couple more minutes to join as well today, I think that it, it's clear that this topic and this concept and this idea resonates with so many of us as we're trying to to navigate the, the field of information and most often misinformation that we're bombarded with to figure out what's the truth, what's not the truth, what's in between, and how we move forward together in this pandemic. So with that, I will share my screen, um, or I will attempt to share my screen, and get started. Can everybody see my screen? Wonderful. Okay, so health information and misinformation during COVID-19, what can we believe? Look, we are all living through this pandemic together. It's been over half of a year together um, and so much has happened since March, right? This feels a couple of years ago for most of us. What we're also living through is this parallel phenomenon, fair, parallel experience of being bombarded with information and misinformation. So the equation that we're all kind of living with right now is we're living through a highly infectious virus plus misinformation in many cases, and it's equaled a perfect storm in our society. What we know is this phenomenon is frankly not new to COVID-19. So recent examples where we've seen, again, a highly infectious virus or disease, plus lots of misinformation equaling a perfect storm and continuing perfect storms are uh, in recent examples of the Ebola virus and as well as mandatory school vaccination controversies, very specifically around the measles vaccine here in the United States. But this time it's a little bit different, right? Because the COVID-19 pandemic is one that we're all impacted by. There's not a single one of us in this country, in this world that is not somehow touched by this virus. And, and as a result, also not somehow touched by the information and misinformation that's being released about this virus. So when we kind of take a minute to think about what are the contributing factors for this for this climate and environment of confusion and misinformation? Well, there's a few things that we need to take a look at. Primarily a lack of information. We don't have all of the information about this pandemic. We don't have all of the information necessarily about its causes, how to treat it, how to prevent it, about a vaccine, how to move forward. So that's very confusing for the public, right? There's also, and really importantly, mixed messaging. So we're getting lots of mis mixed messages around this virus, and we have since the beginning, as to what causes it, how it spreads, who's the most susceptible, what can we do, what can we use to, to protect ourselves and our families, um, is there a cure, is there not a cure, what treatments work, what treatments don't work, uh, when is this vaccine coming out, long-awaited vaccine, right? So lots of mixed messaging and really difficult to decipher What's the proper information? 
conflicting sources of information. Look, this is, this is probably one of the most important contributing factors, right? Because we are in a place in our country, in our world, in our society right now, that really how you understand an issue very much is related to where you get your information from. And sort, some sources of information are providing extraordinarily different um, uh, viewpoints and, and quote unquote evidence about the COVID-19 pandemic. Inconsistent policies, we'll talk a little bit more about policies in a second, but we've seen a wide variety of policies at the national, state, and local levels as they relate to this pandemic, which has certainly only contributed to the public con uh, confusion on the issue, and this diminishing value of expertise. Right, and I'm really excited to hear uh, what my what my other panelists have to say about this diminishing value of expertise. We're in this interesting place in our society and our in our culture right now, where. Um, all experts and who is considered an expert is kind of up for grabs and all expertise that is offered seems to be somehow equal. And so I'm um, really looking forward to delving into that a little bit deeper. What's also interesting at this moment is that the scientific community, the medical community, public health community, and thought leaders in these spaces have been extremely vocal about the role of information and misinformation in the pandemic and how, frankly, the the phenomenon of misinformation has, has actually served as somewhat of a super spreader for the pandemic. And here's just a few examples of leading journals and thought leaders. Um, and there's many, many more. And, there, and I'm sure there'll be continuing to be many, many more. So where we're at is really trying to take a look at why is quality information so vital for this COVID-19 pandemic? Why is the, the importance of quality reliable evidence-based uh, emphasis asterisk on evidence-based information so vital right now? And really in the alternative, why is misinformation so particularly dangerous for this pandemic? Well, we know that the type of information that we get about health, the type of information we get about public health emergencies and challenges influences our personal and group beliefs. And, and so let's, let's take an example, and uh, probably one of the best examples in the COVID-19 pandemic is masks, right? So what we understand about the pandemic, is this, is this real? Is this a hoax? Is this, um, is, is this viral? Can I get it? it? How I understand that information influences my personal beliefs, influences our group beliefs, right? And then next, what I believe influences my personal and our group behaviors. So if I believe this pandemic is real, if I believe what the science to date has to say about how it spreads and the importance of masks in protecting ourselves from, from contracting and, and giving the virus, then I'm going to behave in a way that would protect myself and protect others, i.e. Uh, a really important way, wear masks, right? And then also we have to think about policies that govern populations at this time. Uh, in, the, in the absence of really a concerted national uh, policy effort, what we've seen is that many of the decisions around public health responses, whether it, it relates to what uh, businesses, what entities can be open, around mask mandates or, or lack of mandates um, and all kinds of, of uh, regulations in between have really been left to the states. And what we've seen is some states have certainly taken much stronger hand via their governor on regulations and some states have not and some states have been somewhere in between and probably Arizona falls in the somewhere in between category, right? And all of that sort of mismatch patchwork approach to our policies have not only contributed to the misinformation and sort of confusion in understanding of this topic, but certainly also co contributed to the outcomes during this pandemic as well. And so I spoke a little bit about masks. I think we can apply uh, the example around masks also to social distancing and, and information we've gotten about certain treatments. And again, I, I will leave that to, um, to our other panels to speak a little bit more about that. And before we get into, into the larger discussion here, it's really important, I think, to identify what are some underlying, underlying drivers of this misinformation? What are some underlying, underlying drivers of the conflict that we're seeing here? Well, um, number one, this concept of an individual liberties versus the public good. Um, I think if you look at pretty much any public health challenge, uh, health policy challenge, especially in the United States, 
this is the underlying driver, uh, individual liberties versus the public good, right? And which one do I ascribe to? Do I ascribe to them every single time, sometimes? And how does that apply right now during the pandemic? How am I willing to curtail my behaviors and curtail the behaviors of my community for the public good? Right, and what information do I have that actually um, uh, drives my belief system here? The evolving nature of science. This is a really tough and important one here in the pandemic. We're living through this pandemic. We're learning about this pandemic as we're living through it, right? What we understood in March is not the same thing as what we understand today. And that's not the same thing as what we're hopefully going to be understanding in, say, February. Um, masks are a great example. And, you know, there's been some recent um, references to, to Dr. Anthony Fauci and what he said about masks in, in March and how, um, based on evidence, based on what the science has said, his messaging around masks has changed. But that's actually been somewhat confusing, not just Dr. Fauci's words, but, but, but this evolving nature of science, right? It's not a static thing. It evolves, it changes, we learn. Um, that can be incredibly confusing for the public. The politicization of the virus has, has been a real driver it, that's adding to the confusion, right? So in many cases, all too often, how we view the virus, how we view information that we receive, the sources of information that we, that, 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 um, that we use, tends to be um, very aligned with political parties and ideologies. And that has served in many cases also as a super spreader for this virus. Um, and that's not really about either any political party. It's really about this is this is a public health emergency and, and somehow politics has very much infiltrated this issue. And finally, inconsistent approaches. Again, not from just a policy perspective, but the policy perspective is incredibly important. We have 50 states, we've seen 50 different approaches, if not more, um, but also different approaches as it's come from the CDC, from the WHO, from the presidential administration, from different scientific organizations, from different news networks and media outlets, as well as kind of where else we get our information from, our communities, our loved ones, our families, right? And and so because of this patchwork of approaches, um, our understanding as a society of this pandemic has been and continues to be quite confused. So at that, I'm going to stop, if I can, and I'd love to hear from my colleague, Dr. Quinn Snyder. Thank you, Dr. Reddy. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, so my name is Quinn Snyder, and I'm an emergency physician, and I'm also the director of analytics in Arizona Regional Operations for a physicians group called American Physician Partners. Thank you so much for having me here today. Um, I'm going to be speaking about doctoring in the COVID information overload era. Uh, Dr. Reddy's presentation was, uh, was really outstanding and truly provides an outline for all the different things I'm about to share with you here today about my personal experience throughout the pandemic. So on March 1st, 2020, this is a day that I will never forget for a variety of reasons. Uh, one of which was because that evening, I remember coming across this headline in the Washington Post that said, coronavirus may have spread undetected for weeks in Washington state, which reported first two deaths in the US. And when you, uh, when you read the article, it details how scientists in Washington state had done a genetic analysis of coronavirus samples that they had at that time and had determined that in all likelihood, the virus had been circulating undetected for a period of six weeks prior to their analysis. So for me at that point, this was my big red flag moment. This was the moment that I knew that we were about to be in serious trouble and that we were about to enter a significant pandemic here in America. March 1st, 2020 was also the date of my 40th birthday. I had a party at my house with 75 people. No one was wearing masks. No one was physical distancing. It was literally the last time I went to an event like that. And frankly, I don't know when the next time will be that I'll get to be at a wonderful event like that. So what ensued was confusion among all people in society, but uh, not, not just general population, but doctors as well. 
Uh, so many questions came about uh, during those early months, uh, including, you know, how early are you intubating people? You know, uh, a lot of the data coming out of Italy, our Italian colleagues were recommending uh, early intubation for people in significant respiratory distress. However, ultimately the experience of uh, physicians in New York in March and April indicated that it was probably best to delay endotracheal intubation uh, by providing supplemental oxygen and high flow oxygen prior to that. And that has become uh, more or less the standard of care at this point. We tend to provide as much oxygen as we can without inserting a breathing tube. Uh, other things doctors were talking about, are you taking hydroxychloroquine? My whole family is on it. I had colleagues who were certainly taking hydroxychloroquine and were giving it to their entire families. I personally never took it and I never gave it to my uh, family either. Um, and frankly, some of the early data were interesting. There were some early anecdotal evidence uh, and also some uh, uh, early retrospective analyses that looked promising that hydroxychloroquine may actually be helpful. However, once the randomized double blind and placebo controlled trials came about, uh, it became clear that hydroxychloroquine is not an effective uh, treatment for COVID-19 pretty much at any stage of the virus, including uh, as pre-exposure prophylaxis. Um, did you try this intubation box? Uh, there was this period of time where um, we knew that endotracheal intubation was a very high risk for procedure in terms of the spread of droplets and aerosols. Um, and uh, we, um, it, many people had developed these uh, boxes, these large plastic boxes that we would put over a patient's head uh, while we were intubating them. And uh, we would slip our hands through the box and intubate them and hopefully contain the droplets and aerosols from spreading in the room. However, a couple months later, an Australian study came out that said, in all likelihood, these boxes were actually probably increasing the spread of aerosols in the room, oddly enough. And this happens in science and medicine quite frequently. We, uh, we think that we reached a conclusion just simply based upon common sense. And then once we do the study and we do the trial, we realize that it's something completely different. Um, so those have actually fallen out of fashion. Um, also, how are you decontaminating your masks at home? Um, in, in case you're not aware, there is a continuing uh, shortage of PPE in this country and throughout the world. Um, and as a result of that, we have to uh, find ways to decontaminate our masks. And there was significant discussion among me and my colleagues as to the optimal way to decontaminate masks. Uh, I uh, knew of people putting their masks in the oven at low temperatures, uh, people who were using rice cookers, uh, people who were waving UV light wands or throwing them into large chambers with vaporous hydrogen peroxide. Uh, ultimately, uh, most of us, including myself, now have probably settled more than anything on simply uh, throwing our N95 mask into a paper bag, tossing it in the trunk of our car and waiting 72 hours before using it again. But during that time, trying to figure out the best way to decontaminate masks was very challenging. There's just been a torrent of new information throughout the pandemic. And, and this is just one example of uh, how, how fast the information was coming out and my ability to absorb it uh, was uh, limited, frankly. Um, on June 16th, this article came out in Stat News, which is a great medical publication, and it said, major study finds common steroid reduces deaths among patients with severe COVID-19. Now, the preliminary results of that study were that dexamethasone was, uh, would reduce the mortality rate of ventilated COVID patients by 35%, which was a huge deal. And still to this day, uh, this trial called the recovery trial was probably the most important study um, in the course of the pandemic. But I only got this headline uh, as I was walking into work and that day when I started seeing patients, pretty much anybody with, that I suspected had COVID-19 that day, I was giving them steroids. Um, later on, I realized that the details of the study uh, indicated that steroids were probably not appropriate for non-hospitalized COVID patients. So obviously I quickly changed that practice where I wasn't giving them to everybody, but luckily dexamethasone is a largely harmless drug. Still, uh, it just represents the fact that I was trying to keep up with the best information. It was very challenging. Obviously, significant confusion among patients. Uh, are you really not going to give me a COVID test? At the beginning of the pandemic where we couldn't get COVID tests readily, this was, this was very challenging for us as providers and obviously for patients as well. So much confusion about uh, when you could obtain a test, whether or not you met criteria or not. Uh, unfortunately, I think that actually resulted in a lot of people not going to get tests when they should have. Um, oh, don't worry about it, doc. You don't need to wear a mask. The virus comes from 5G radio towers, not people. I've actually heard this more than once. Uh, the first time I heard this, I uh, frankly, I was, I was flabbergasted to, to hear uh, th that people actually believed uh, this kind of thing. But what I did was I approached it very calmly and I said, sir, uh, you know, uh, my best understanding is that the virus is actually largely a droplet-based disease that is spread from person to person transmission and that masks actually significantly reduce the spread of this virus. Do you understand? 
And he said, yes, and he put his mask on for the remainder of the encounter and hopefully uh, out in the general public as well. Um, oh, but neck gaiters are way more comfortable than masks. Yes, I, I understand that as well. Neck gaiters are more comfortable than masks, but a recent study from Duke ultimately showed that neck gaiters were probably causing increased aerosolization of viral particles and potentially were, were harmful to wear. So I advise people against wearing neck gaiters at this point. And lastly, the president doesn't wear a mask, why should I? And this is a very, very challenging question to deal with. But what I tell people is, I say, you know what? That's true, the president doesn't wear a mask or he didn't wear a mask. And obviously he unfortunately suffered some consequences as a result of that. But the truth is the president's not a doctor. He's not a public health official. He's not a scientist and he doesn't know the best practices. And in all likelihood, people should be turning to those individuals instead for how best to combat this virus. So when there's all this uh, confusion throughout the uh, throughout the pandemic, how do you uh, how do you clear all this distortion? Well, you clear it with data, really great data. And the number one place that I like to go personally is the Arizona Department of Health Services website. If you haven't uh, checked out their dashboard yet, please do so at some point today. Check it out. They they do some great data aggregation from uh, all the different hospital systems and the uh, labs in our state. Um, for the most part, it's an excellent resource. There's some issues on the positivity rate. I could go into that at greater detail and that would take probably another, uh, another 15 minutes of my time at least uh, to do. So I'll avoid that. However, if you're interested in checking out some of those issues, you might wanna uh, look online as well. Um, uh, Josh LeBaron and his team at the ASU Biodesign Institute have really done a spectacular job of uh, aggregating data and prevent, er, presenting it to, um, to uh, Arizonans, uh, uh, data that are relevant to, uh, to our state. The COVID tracking project and Johns Hopkins do an amazing job as well. They're kind of the gold standard data aggregators throughout the pandemic. In terms of sheer reporting, me personally, I believe that NPR is doing uh, the best job in terms of not just um, taking a look at the data, but also combining that data with personal stories and really bringing it to life. The Post and New York Times have great um, uh, interactive uh, data visualizations as well that are great. If you're curious about contact tracing and testing status, Go to testandtrace.com. It'll really show you uh, how much of a, uh, uh, frankly, a disaster our, our uh, contact tracing apparatus has been in this country. Um, we, we really have been uh, unable to do contact tracing and I'll detail some of the resources that we would need to actually get to where we need to be. And lastly, if you're interested in some projection analyses, uh, I, I personally recommend the uh, University of Washington website, the IHME. They do a really great job of uh, creating new projections. And frankly, um, they were the ones who actually predicted a uh, spike over the summer here in Arizona. Um, so I would definitely check that out. Um, so I am, in addition to being an emergency physician, I'm also a data analyst. And what does any good uh, data analyst do during the time of COVID? Well, you try to aggregate and bring together as many variables as possible that you think are going to be relevant to your practice and create a dashboard. So what I did, one of the things we did was track the number of COVID positive results by date of service in our emergency department. You can see in the beginning of May, when uh, I finally assembled my full dashboard, that things were, you know, we were having one, three, five cases. So by the end of the month, we had 11, 10, and then June hit. And June, all of a sudden, the number of cases that were coming into my ED started to explode, including one day where we even had over 60 people. And this is one emergency department. Over 60 people came in who turned out to be uh, COVID positive. So uh, I, I'm, I'm guessing most people uh, on this uh, are, are aware of what had happened in July, but our pandemic, uh, or the first wave, uh, peaked here on July 13th when we had over 3,500 inpatient hospitalizations. And leading up to that time, myself and many public health officials and scientists, we all felt that uh, we needed to speak out. We needed to let people know what was going on. So on June 1st, uh, I was able to get together uh, 160 Arizona physicians who signed on to, a, um, uh, to an op-ed piece that was published in the Arizona Daily Star called Test, Trace, and Isolate in Arizona Now, uh, discussing the, the um, need for uh, much increased testing and tracing in particular, which was not happening at that point. Um, I continued to speak out and then by the end of the month, I had the Today Show call me and they said, hey, do you wanna do a segment on the Today Show? And you know, I am not a, uh, a accustomed to public speaking, frankly. Uh, it's, I've never been on TV before that time, certainly not a national live broadcast, but uh, you know, I, um, I held my breath and said, yes, I'll do it uh, because I felt like it was important to 
to do it for the community. And um, after that, it was just an avalanche of phone calls I started getting. I ended up being all over the place. I was on CNN and BBC World News, NPR multiple times. I was on PBS NewsHour after uh, Dr. Fauci, which to be even proximate to Dr. Fauci was one of the greatest honors of my career. Um, and that was all in, in July. And uh, I, I felt really glad to be able to speak out uh, on behalf of what was going on in our state and uh, how dangerous things had become here. So, and these are the July numbers in case you're interested. So I had a feeling that, and this shows the power of data, and I had a feeling that towards the beginning of the month, as things started to decline, that we were in a deceleratory phase of the virus, and that hopefully within a couple of weeks, once that deceleration had started, it looks like at the beginning of the month that we would ultimately start to get out of uh, the danger zone. And luckily we did. And just so you're aware, and I, and I suspect many, many of you are, we're we're potentially entering a, a second wave here in Arizona right now, um, and we need to stay very alert as to what's going on. So in terms of my personal experience and what I've learned as a result of the, the past uh, eight months of my life, which I feel like I've aged eight years, frankly, um, is that we must speak out for science. And the COVID era provides an overwhelming array of information that is difficult for everyone to process, in, including um, patients and the general population to doctors and scientists. It's so hard to keep up with everything, but experts and surrogates must proactively communicate and demonstrate behaviors according to the best current evidence. Scientific facts are more effectively communicated calmly and without anger. People do not respond to anger. They're not going to listen to you if yeah, just, just because you disagree with them and just because um, uh, you, you shouldn't, you shouldn't use that as a, uh, as, as a moment to, um, to get so frustrated with them that you, you become angry. I think that's important to know. And then lastly, the scientific community cannot stay silent in the face of dangerous misinformation, truly misinformation that will result in lives lost. It's important for us to do this uh, as a community service. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Snyder. So much to think about there, and I know is going to garner lots of conversation and questions. Um, we have something very similar in common, which is um, we, sp we speak super fast. So that's great. <laughs> so we get a lot of information out in a short amount of time. So I think we're actually gonna have a couple of extra minutes at the end to talk. So that's wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, and now I wanna switch it over to my colleague at Cronkite, Dr. Christy Rushke. Uh, Dr. Rushke, please, as our media expert. Sure, let me go ahead and share my screen. I also am a fast talker, so I think there will be lots of good time for Q&A at the end, which is just how I like it too. Um, so um, as Dr. Reddy had mentioned at the beginning, I um, am the managing director of the News Collab and we're a media literacy initiative at the Conkite School aimed at helping people better understand how news and information work and how they move about in systems. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more today about media literacy and what we can do both as professionals and also in our personal lives to help fight misinformation. So this was a meme that I saw on Facebook. Someone posted it maybe about a month ago. And then every time I see something like this, which, which happens on the regular, I just kind of shake my head and, and have to laugh because you know when you work in journalism, you become very used to sort of being the butt of the joke and the source of everyone's ire. But I wanna point out that although this is a common sentiment, um, it couldn't be farther from the truth. There is literally more accurate information accessible to the regular person today than ever before in history. Um, the problem is there's also more inaccurate information. And when we're talking about COVID or really anything else, that misinformation can you know, run the gamut from just um, you know, like an honest mistake to something that's sort of maybe unintentionally misleading to things that are very intentionally misleading and even you know, trying to harm people. And so there's a wide array of bad information that we have out there. And, and really what's doing us in, you know, it is the misinformation, but it's also just the general overload of information. We are overwhelmed and we are overloaded. And I know from teaching, from years of teaching and from researching media literacy that this confusion can cause us to, you know, it reduces our even already our short attention spans. So we're not paying the attention to all this information that we need to. It's all quick scans of headlines. 
Um, we also know that um, the skepticism that we have easily slides into cynicism in the face of too much conflicting information. And when we're cynical, we just have this, you know, tendency to throw our hands up and say, I can't believe anything anymore. So I'm just going to ignore everything. And obviously we can't do that. Um, and we're also more susceptible to misinformation. We make, we make mistakes and are, we make, we have lapses in judgment when we're overwhelmed with information. So the misinformation problem is really complex. And we've talked about these things that in the previous presentations, I appreciate Dr. Snyder and Dr. Reddy bringing these things up, but I want to just go ahead and repeat that we've got a lot of different conflicting things contributing to this overload. And, and that's again, the decrease attention. Um, Dr. Reddy mentioned the decline in trust, which I'll talk a little bit more about here in a second. Um, and we also, you know, differences in people's education, not only in terms of formal education and, and in the case of COVID, you know, scientific and health information, but also just education on how to use digital and social media. You know, the, the disparities between how well people can use those technologies um, is, is a problem. <clears throat> We've also seen this redefinition of expertise and reputation based on digital and social media. So, so now we, you know, we can often kind of equate our friend who we think is really smart and cool with our doctor. And it's much easier to do when we're sharing information so fast and so quick, <clears throat> excuse me. So this is a, a, some, a chart from a global report, <clears throat> excuse me, that the strategic information firm Edelman does every year, they call it the trust barometer. And so what we're looking at here is that there is um, a general distrust in across all institutions, and this is happening worldwide. Um, so it's not it's not just the media; it's also government, business, and NGOs are a little bit higher in some populations. Um, this is also true in science, although it's not on this graph. Um, but one of the things that Edelman drilled down into in the 2020 report, which I thought was really interesting, this came out pre-COVID, so I imagine that this continues to perseverate. Is this gap in trust? between what Edelman refers to as the informed public and the mass population. So they define informed public as college educated people who tend to consume more media and information and who are in the top 25% of household income um, in their age group. So this, this group of people tend to have more trust in institutions um, like the media, like science, like business than the mass population. And this gap is widening. They've noticed a trend of this widening gap. So this becomes a communication problem when we think about how we communicate to different populations and how we might speak to patients and clients and constituents in terms of sort of where they fall and how they believe in these institutions. And when we drill down specifically into the media, we can see that this gap is quite wide, quite wide. The 20% or 20 point gap, I should say, between the informed public and the mass population in terms of how well the media do in some of these categories. And now I wanna, I wanna put out this caveat that I have with a lot of survey research related to news, which is this like bucket of the media is, it's not a helpful construct. Um, the media is not a monolith. It's not one thing. Um, every news organization works a little bit differently and every medium of news works a little bit differently. And the media covers things that aren't even news. You know, it covers, can cover social media platforms. It can cover entertainment. Um, and so asking people about the media, it's a little bit misleading, but I do want to point out that some of these areas in which people have a very, you know, they, they are pretty adamant that media are not doing their job are in basically meeting people's information needs. So we have this prevailing attitude globally that the people who are, you know, the professionals who are meant to provide us information are not doing their jobs. And again, I think part of that's perpetuated by this notion that there is a media, singular, um, when that clearly is not the case. And a lot of times when you ask questions in this, in this vein, what's coming to people's minds is cable news, really, is, is kind of the, is the is code for media or they're talking about social media and digital media as this like one, again, this one big lump of a thing. So a little bit of an issue with some of these surveys, but I do still think it's compelling information. What complicates things further, when we get into sort of what I do with my job and journal, a lot of journalism research, when we talk about what people know about journalism, and the truth is that people don't know a lot about journalism is constructed. Um, and we talked about common sense in a previous conversation that journalists think that how news is produced is common sense because it's not hard, right? It's not rocket science, but it is a very specific process that most people aren't familiar with. Um, and that there even is a process and that there are you know, ethical considerations and, and policies that we have in place in, or as organizations and as a field 
uh, which we abide by. Um, and so it's very tough for people sometimes to distinguish between types of information, not only credible news outlets and how to determine whether one is credible or not, but also the kinds of content they produce. So you might hear people talk about how the New York Times, for instance, is a left-leaning publication. Usually what people mean is that their opinion section has a lot of left-leaning opinion writers and that they publish a lot of left-leaning op-eds. But what most people don't understand is that the editorial department of a news organization is completely separate from the news department. And the people that write opinion pieces do not write news pieces and, and vice versa. Um, and even just that little bit of understanding can help people understand, you know, get the nuance a little bit better about how news is produced. Um, and so I think it's really important that we we understand as 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 health professionals and people who work with others that this basic understanding of how we're getting our information really isn't a basic understanding. There's a lot of confusion there. And we also see people sharing a lot on social media, opinion pieces or otherwise really biased, or I guess I should say, you know, things that have a very decided point of view. Bias isn't inherently bad. Bias just means you're coming from something from a specific place. But when people conflate, you know, a point of view with news, then it makes people, it tends to get people real riled up, right? The whole point of opinion pieces is to get people riled up. And that's not how we want to deliver information. As Dr. Snyder said before, we want to deliver this information in a calm way. And that's what the news does. But guess what? News is not is never as interesting as these, you know, more sensational opinion pieces. And so people are going to gravitate to those. So what we find is that, you know, again, I've mentioned our lack of attention. And if we're social media users and we're just scrolling, 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 we're only seeing headlines and we're reacting to things based on headlines. I think the anecdote about uh, dexamethasone and the headline was like, oh, I'm going to react to this because this seems important and that we all do that. I mean, and it, that's okay, but it's also important to stop and take a minute to like learn more about something, especially before you share it with others. So kind of getting into what can we do to sort of overcome some of this confusion about how news is produced and where to go for good sources uh, that in the previous two present, uh, presentations, we saw several different news outlets that I would, I would suggest are quite credible. I'm not gonna add to that. I'm going to say that all news outlets are, you know, are worth taking a look at to, to assess individually, right? And the outlets that consistently produce credible, well-vetted, reliable information, and like the ones that you've mentioned already, are the ones that always kind of as a baseline deserve our trust. That doesn't mean they're not going to make mistakes, and that doesn't mean that you might not agree with everything that they do, so you should really place the value judgment on that particular piece of information. And when in doubt, if you're not familiar with a news outlet or a, an organization that's providing some information, I mean, truly the best thing that you can do is Google it. Because if it's something that is, is generally accepted to be true, you'll see a lot of other sources corroborating that information. And that's really important. Um, so you know, even if you've never heard of, uh, there's a lot of local news outlets. In fact, this is a really key problem in the misinformation landscape right now. Local news outlets masquerading as news, which are really partisan um, kind of like content farms. So if you've not heard of a source, Google it and find out what's behind it and or find out if there are other news organizations reporting the same thing. Um, and, and then once you've found those places that you believe are consistently providing that credible information, then rely on those and maybe take a step back from the social media at times and give yourself the break or the cable, incessant cable TV news. I'm not a TV watcher myself, so but I know that's a huge problem. It's like, just turn it off, just take a step back. Um, and then I think from a, like the perspective of a health professional and media professionals, it's really important that we, that we explain, sorry, I lost my turn of thought there for a second, explain to our constituents, explain to our patients how we've come to trust the sources that we trust. We shouldn't shy away from sharing the information that we know to be fact, you know, factual and accurate, and we should share that information with our constituents. And a part of that is explaining why we trust it. And so, I mean, I think we're used to saying, oh, I think the New York Times is doing great work. Well, tell me what that means. Give me some examples, find some key pieces of news that you would want to share with others. And I think, you know, if you're a physician or you're regularly meeting with patients, it's probably not a bad idea to even have those on hand, whether it's a printout or I'll send a link to you, you know, and explain that 
you're a, you're a medical professional or a health professional, but you're also a media consumer. And this is how you're arriving at your decisions and sharing that with your, your patients, I think is a really, really important thing. And the other thing I think is, is, you know, I'm, I'm not, this is not necessarily, I'm not a science communication expert, but we don't do a great job explaining how peer review is, what peer review is, what it means, what is, um, you know, a preprint publication and why with this influx of, of, of studies that are coming out in COVID, one day something is the latest thing and the next day it's not a thing anymore. And, and people don't understand that's science. That's what science is. And if we're not explaining that to people, it can feel very isolating for them. And what it turns out to, which I think both of the previous presentations covered quite nicely, is there's a lack of trust in any information. Well, I remember when masks were bad and I'm, so I'm sticking with that, you know? So you just yesterday, you told me this and now you're telling me this. We need to explain that process. And I think explaining how we arrive at consensus in terms of scientific inquiry is also very important. All fields have a way that they arrive at consensus and they have bodies that sort of demonstrate that consensus thinking. And, and that's not information that's accessible to the general public and it really should be. Um, this has been said a couple of times. I'll just repeat it because I think it's really important. Don't let your emotions rule. Um, news organizations, even the credible ones, frankly, are um, they, they work when they get people interested in the story. They make money when they get people interested in the story. So they write headlines that maybe seem a little bit more interesting than the actual story so that they can get clicks. This is a function of the business model. Um, and usually the emotions that drive us, I think we all can relate to this, are fear and anger. You know, we're gonna be much more riled up and willing to, you know, speak out on something that we're afraid of or we're mad about. Um, so don't let your emotions rule. Again, take a step back. If you something you've read has made your blood boil or you feel incredibly vindicated in that moment, that is the sign that you absolutely should not share that information in the moment. You should stop, should walk away, you know, get a glass of water, whatever you need to do, because chances are you'll have forgotten that feeling will go away, you know, in the time it takes you to drink that glass of water and you won't feel so compelled to share it. Or if you do, then take then take the time to vet that information and make sure it's accurate. And then you can share it, right? We all want to be good, conscious media consumers and contr contribute positively to our information environments, even if that means like a group text with your family. This does not have to be you in a professional capacity. This is you at a personal capacity as well. And then I also want to just repeat that we need to repeat the facts. So masks, mitigate the spread of COVID. You should say that 5,000 times a day <laughs> and, 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 no, and, and also not pay lip service to the idea that it doesn't because we remember things that are repeated. And so when people repeat lies, even if those lies, or maybe even especially if those lies come from influential people, they will, people will remember that lie. They will not remember the way that you debunked the lie. They will remember the lie. So it is all of our jobs as experts. And I like what Dr. Snyder said about speaking up for science. It's how we do that best is in clear, concise repetition of factual information um, and localize that information that, so that it emphasizes it, the impact on the person in their daily life. Um, because those data dashboards, why I, I also find them very, very valuable, <laughs> to be honest, like don't make any sense to me. So I can see it's, I, I can see this means bad, this means good, but like, what does that actually mean to me today? Should I go outside? Should I eat on that patio? You know, how am I going to make decisions on that? Explain, you know, try to explain that to me. And then finally, kind of going off of what others have said before me, practice empathy. So I think the calm demeanor is really good, but I think empathy in particular is important. It doesn't do anyone any good to be dismissive of conspiracy claims and hoaxes as, as far-fetched as they seem to us, because there's a reason people believe that. Um, and chances are it's, it's attached to some pretty deep belief, other deep beliefs. And so we're not gonna get any, gain any headway with people if we make fun of them, or we make them feel stupid. Um, we have to understand that they're as confused as we are. And I think you know that shared reality of confusion and learning as we go is actually a really great place to be right now and, and, and you know, kind of coming together for the common good um, and recognizing our shared humanity, I think is a really important thing to remember right now. And then this is just more about me. You can follow me on Twitter um, if you're on Twitter and, um, and, and more about the news collab and I will stop sharing now. Great, thank you so much. Um, 
Oh my goodness. Again, so much great information. I know it's going to garner lots of discussion. Uh, I, I do follow you, Dr. Roshke, on, on Twitter and um, um, phenomenal work that's happening at the, at the News Lab. So thank you for that. I, I'm wondering if, um, I just want to remind folks, I know that there's a chat box and there's a Q&A box. If you could put your comments, questions, et cetera, in the chat box instead of the Q&A box, it'll just kind of keep, make it easier um, uh, to, to keep on top of it. And what I'd like to do is actually pop on over to the chat box um, and kind of and, and and go over some of the questions and comments that we've received. So to that end, um, our, my colleague Dr. Hunt Brendish will help us sort of moderate that piece. So Dr. Hunt Brendish, take it away. Thank you so much, Dr. Reddy. And I would like to thank all of our panelists for a fantastic discussion. Um, you've left us all with so much to think about and so much to do. Um, we have jobs um, as academics and clinicians to get out there and spread the science and keep the facts front going. So I really appreciate your presentations. And I think this is going to spur a lot of great questions and some conversations. So without further ado, I'd like to get started with our questions. So the first one is going to Dr. Snyder. Um, we have a comment here about some of the news sources that were quoted in your presentation. And a question came up is, are there other sources, say the Wall Street Journal, um, are they unreliable? You know, can you comment on that? Uh, I think the Wall Street Journal is a reliable publication, certainly. I, I've just noticed from my personal experience and uh, perhaps a lot of this is fueled by being, remember, I, I'm, I'm a data analyst in addition to being an emergency physician. Uh, I, I look for the publications that I think uh, have the uh, the most digestible data visualizations and the data content that I find most relevant to my practice. So I just find that certain publications tend to spend more time uh, doing uh, that kind of work. And the New York Times, uh, Washington Post, uh, in terms of the big newspapers, uh, do, do a very good job. The Wall Street Journal does as well, but uh, I, I find that the other um, data is just simply somewhat more accessible to me. That makes sense. Dr. Roshke, did you have a, a follow-up? I was, I was just going to add too that um, you know the Wall Street Journal is a business publication, so they're going to have a different focus. They're, I mean, they'll cover COVID obviously, but their angle is always going to be a little bit different than a general national newspaper. Um, and I think the reason why the Wall Street Journal is is perceived as being right of center is predominantly, again, as I was saying before, because of its opinion section. Um, its opinion section is historically quite conservative, and I mean, business. I suppose you could argue maybe leans a little right. But the, the reporting in the Wall Street Journal is actually, you know, kind of runs the gamut, as does, I would argue, the Post and, and the Washington, or the New, York, the New York Times and the Washington Post. Okay, that's helpful. And, you know, I really, Dr. Roshke, I really appreciated your distinction between the opinion pieces and the actual news pieces. I think that is something I had not myself thought about. And I think if our audience listened and heard that, I think that will help us when we go out to the community and to the patients and to the people that we're teaching um, and help them understand how to digest the news information and how to disassociate the political affiliations a little bit more and focus on the facts. And so I think that was a really great, a jewel of piece of information. Well, and one thing I'll just add that I didn't say and I meant to is that it's particularly on social media and, and news organizations, and this is actually some of the work that we do as well, um, are starting to label opinion pieces a little bit more clearly. So you'll see in the headlines sort of opinion colon and then the thing. Um, but on social, if those things aren't labeled, it's even it's even harder sometimes to tell the difference. You might get halfway into a story before you're like, oh wait, <laughs> this is not a news story. Um, and, and if you're only looking at headlines that, and then you're sharing these sort of, again, more sensationalist headlines that opinion pieces tend to favor, it just gets very confused. So we really advocate for news organizations to clearly label on social, in their headlines, and anywhere they can to label bylines. So if someone is an opinion contributor, that that's clearly labeled. And those are other things I think, um, tactical things you can point to um, to help your to help your constituents as well. That's helpful. And you know what you guys are, what all three of you touched on so nicely, and something that I think we all forget is the emotions that are are set behind the the pandemic, and the emotions that are that we all feel that come up for us when we think about our own family members and them getting sick or us going to the hospital. And those emotions tie into us being able to sort through these really important pieces of distincting, distinct, distinguishing opinion pieces from facts and the data from, you know, and getting flooded with information. So 
as I said earlier, we have a lot of work to do as educators and communicators to keep this um, conversation going and help people sort through some of this information. Um, but the emotional piece, I think, hits. I feel myself um, when I get, come across people that are saying something that I may not agree with from a factual standpoint, my emotions tend to flood me. So the advice of stamping away and coming back to it was great, <laughs> something we all have to keep in mind. Um, okay, so this question, the second question I have coming in um, is for all three of you, and any one of you can start by answering it. It's really important because this comes up quite a bit. Um, so this is a, a, an attendee who said, my spouse and I live in northern Gila County. I check the Ready Gila website daily to review COVID-19 statistics di distributed by the Gila County Health Department. I check the AZ um, dashboard website daily to check the Arizona and Gila County statistics. The two sites cannot even agree on the body count for COVID-19 deaths in Gila County. If the state and county cannot agree on this basic data, why should lay people like us believe any government data? I, I think that's a really great question. And um, uh, that's, that's something I've certainly struggled with, uh, like I mentioned before about the, the positivity rate. Um, you know, we learned previously that with the positivity rate that the state had actually only been counting uh, positive cases from labs that were reporting both positives and negatives. And that for a while, some labs were just reporting their positives. That has ended that practice re re reportedly. Um, and also some labs are not submitting their data electronically. And when I took a look at the data and um, reconstructed it retroactively, I realized that the state was not reporting about a quarter of their of their total lab cases, and uh, it's it's kind of astonishing. But that um, th there was a flurry of news about this uh, about a month ago. Um, if you're interested in taking a deeper dive, but yeah, it's it's true. There uh, there are definitely some issues with the AZDHS website and reconciling that information with other data sources. And if you see something that doesn't look right, it's important to point it out. And just like the positivity rate. Um, I, I, I would say that, you know, uh, I, I, was, I was part of that apparatus of people who were um, uh, raising the red flag there and saying, hey, something's not right here and people need to understand that, that something's, uh, something's uh, amiss. So um, I, I'd be curious to learn more about what's going on in Gila County, frankly, uh, from hearing this as well. Dr. Uh, Reddy or Dr. Roshke, do you have any other comments on that? Okay, yeah, it's a it's a really it's a real hard issue to deal with because um, it it kind of goes back to the fact that science is evolving. I, I look at it in that framework is that you know we're still trying to figure out how to record all the data and how to capture it and how to re report it back. So it's just an example of the fact that we just have to teach people that this is not a perfect process and it's brand new for everybody. And I think having that patience to understand the process may help a little bit along the way, but it is it is challenging. Um, maybe that person who submitted the question could reach out to you with uh, further information about what's going on there. Absolutely, yeah, yeah that'd be great. Okay, uh, another good question just came in, really good question. Please explain why such a range of COVID testing, some results within minutes or hours in facilities and others that take up to two weeks. So that's a really good question. I get that asked that a lot. Uh, so there's there's different kinds of uh, of COVID testing out there. You know, for a long time, the only type of test that we had available to us was PCR based testing. And um, you know, the the testing turnaround times uh, have have improved significantly. Uh, at first, um, it was taking uh, you know a few days, and then in July, I personally got a COVID test in July. It took. 12 days to return. An emergency physician getting a test took 12 days, which was totally unacceptable. Um, and uh, we, we knew we, that was part of the reason why we were in serious trouble, frankly. Um, but now uh, the testing has loosened up significantly and you can actually get rapid tests in a lot of places. There are a lot of private outlets that are offering rapid tests, even same day. You can go and make uh, appointments online. Um, uh, there, there's a variety of different uh, places that are offering them now, and sometimes you have to pay out of pocket, sometimes insurance will cover it, uh, but the PCR test now will, um, will take about 24 hours uh, turnaround time in most outlets, um, and then the rapid test uh, can be as quick as 20 minutes, um, and uh, the rapid tests are almost as good as the PCR test, which is great, but um, you know, we, we need to expand that rapid testing significantly. I, I hope that uh, soon enough, we'll get to the point where literally you can wake up on any day 
And for any reason whatsoever, you can roll out of bed and go get your COVID test and have the results within minutes. Um, it, it truly, if we're gonna ultimately contain this pandemic properly, um, that we're, we're gonna need to have some sort of apparatus like that. And it exists in some places. We can do it here in Arizona. I just wanted to add to that, um, which is a point that Dr. Roshke made earlier um, in that we really highlight a lot of negative news and it's not as fun or interesting or sexy to highlight positive news, right? So to your point, Dr. Snyder, about sort of wait times and, and difficulty in obtaining tests earlier in the summer, I mean, I know a lot of people experience that, right? But it is a lot easier to get a test these days and the turnaround times are a lot quicker, but we don't actually see a lot of information about that right? So unless you're kind of in public health, in healthcare, or just particularly savvy to this information, I think there's still a perception in the public that it's really hard to get a test and tests take a really long time. And by the way, there's so, so, so many false negatives, right? And so you can't believe these tests anyway, what's even the point? And I think it really, it really speaks to what Dr. Rashke said. I mean, there's this, we, there's a focus on the, the information and the headlines that sell and that get clicks, right? Um, and then we tend to hold on to that information and then we're spreading the information too. I, I wanted to just actually, if it's okay, just ask a quick question to, to the panelists as well. Um, Dr. Ashi, you mentioned a, a minute ago about social, and uh, I know you're talking about social media, and oh my goodness, what a, what a can of worms that is, right? But social media in this space has been incredibly impactful, right? And so articles that people are pulling from social media, chat rooms, um, discussion boards, et cetera, can you speak, can, can both of you kind of speak a little bit to how to handle that, how to, um, how to navigate it? And then also, Dr. Snyder, how to deal with patients that are really getting most of their information that way. Most people are getting their information that way, right? Uh, uh, boy, I wish I had the answer to that question, Dr. Reddy. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's really the question of the moment. It's uh, people are getting overwhelmed with information from all different sources. And the question is, how can we best outcompete that information with the best, most up-to-date evidence-based um, news? And um, uh, it, it, it's something, uh, you know, like I said, we, ha we have to be proactive about it. It's something that uh, public health officials, we, we, can't, we can't just passively read these headlines and say, oh, that's great. We actually do need to distribute that. And we need to recognize that social media is, um, you know, it's, it's here to stay and there will ultimately be new regulations on it, but it's something that we need to engage with. We shouldn't act like it's not here and that, oh, don't, don't worry about this uh, because people are definitely getting their information from social media. Um, and, and truly, um, you know, you, you almost lose the battle on social media if you're not um, the first to post the article or the first to comment, and you really have to stay on top of it. But at the same time, you have to dutifully um, uh, cull through those articles and make sure what you're posting is legitimate information. So um, it's tough and uh, it's, it, it's a challenge for, for all of us and certainly me. I, I try to, uh, to uh, be careful about, about what I post. Um, yeah, I, I definitely would be curious to hear what Dr. Rashi has to say about that topic as well. Well, I agree with you completely, and particularly the part about how how experts and, and medical professionals really need to be on social media more, because part of the problem is that you see um, concerted efforts in disinformation campaigns where people are coordinated, and the good information is never as well coordinated, right? And so that's part of the problem is that that information is not diffused as 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 intensely as the as the the disinformation. Um, I also want to remind people that social media, like the media, is not one thing, right? So I, I almost get all of my news from social media, but that's because my Twitter feed is almost exclusively news organizations that I trust. And I've taken the time to curate a feed that I find to be incredibly, uh, you know, credible. I follow both of the, my fellow panelists on Twitter. And I also follow a number of lists. Um, for instance, there's a lot of great lists of epidemiologists and other experts that talk specifically about COVID. And when you fill your feed with people that you, you believe that you, you know you can trust because they're credible experts, social media is an excellent way to get information. I mean, is it overwhelming? Yes. Do I spend too much on Twitter? time on Twitter? Absolutely. Um, 
but that's that takes me to almost all of my news. Facebook's a little bit of a different beast, right? Because we're we're more likely to be interacting with friends and family and maybe like people we knew from elementary school. And so you've got sort of a mixed crowd there. And I think the advice I give there is you know, you're, you might love your mom and she might be really smart, but she also might share some really bad memes. So like mom is not the COVID expert, you know, um, different people are the COVID experts. So it's, it's, again, it's evaluating not the person who posted the thing. Cause that's usually not the originator of the information. Like what is the originator of the information? And for most things you should just ignore them. And again, like don't share them. I mean, I think my advice right now in this moment, especially like getting closer to the elect, you know, weeks away from an election, just don't share things unless you feel, you know, like you would get an A on this assignment in school if you shared it, right? This is the threshold here. Um, otherwise, just kind of let it, let it pass. Um, don't feed that fire. Dr. Ashke, thank you so much. And I'm looking at the time and oh my goodness, we're done. Uh-oh. Okay, um, our, our, uh, I just want to note, thank you so much to all of our panels. Thank you so much to all of our guests. It's really important that I note that our next health talk is November 19th, and it's on behavioral medicine and COVID-19 risk reduction from evidence to practice. We will post this talk and the slides next week. Feel free to please um, connect with the panelists if you have any questions. I know we didn't get to a lot of them. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us and hope you learned something today. Lots of food for thought. Stay healthy and vote. Thank you so much.